And then, after you check the phones, if you wouldn't mind opening up to the Gospel of John, or second weekend of what's probably going to take at least a year to move through the Gospel of John. So we'll be looking at verses 4 through 13 this morning in chapter 1. And so as you're turning there, let me begin with prayer. Father, thank you for this time, this opportunity uh, to get together, to, uh, to get into your Word. Thank you for a little bit cooler weather this morning, Lord, and overcast, and Pray that you would give us rain, if that's your will, Lord. I pray also for uh, just all the the fears and anxieties associated with um, how life has been. I pray that you would take those away, that we trust in you, that you would give us encouragement through your word, that you'd help us to meditate on those things that are true and just and noble and praiseworthy, Lord. And um, that as we get into your word once again, that we'd know you more and that we'd serve you better. Just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... One of the most painful experiences of my life took place when I was in grade school. And on that fateful day, my cousins and I were playing tag in the front yard of my grandmother's house there in Cisco, Texas. And though the game started well, there were two issues at play that were about to make my life very unpleasant. First of all, for some reason, in the middle of the yard, there was a metal pipe sticking up with a spigot on top. Apparently, they didn't want to run a hose all the way from the house, and so they had put a spigot there in the yard. And the second problem was that it was dark outside, and the yard didn't have any lights. 
You can guess what happened next. As I ran full speed through the yard, my shin connected with the water pipe, and I was done playing tag for the night because there was some crying I needed to get to. Now, unfortunately, the absence of light in my grandmother's front yard led to a very painful situation, a situation that could have been avoided, and perhaps you've had similar experiences. You know, you go somewhere for a trip, you're in an unfamiliar hotel room, you decide to get up in the middle of the night and you don't remember where you are, and you end up stubbing your toe. Or perhaps you miss a step in a darkened hallway and take a bit of a tumble. Or perhaps worst of all, you've had the experience of walking into your children's room to check on them only to step barefoot onto a Lego brick. The worst of them all. Now, whatever the case may be, we understand that light is invaluable if we want to walk rightly in this world. And just as it is true on a physical level, so it is true from a spiritual standpoint. The truth is, unfortunately, that all human beings come into this world walking in spiritual darkness. And if a human being chooses to remain on that darkened path, that path will eventually lead to spiritual destruction and to eternal judgment. But the fact is, it doesn't have to be that way. The story doesn't have to end in that manner. Instead, spiritual light is available to any who would receive it. As we move through John chapter 1, verses 4 through 13 this morning, we're going to see that the Word, who we looked at last week, God the Son, He's also the light of the world. And anyone who wants to walk in His light will find all that they need in him. So with that said, would you please follow along as I read the passage that we'll be studying this morning. Again, it's John chapter 1, looking at verses 4 through 13, where John writes, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and his name, I'm sorry, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." I divided this passage into four sections. We'll see, first of all, the power of the light, then the witness of the light, the rejection of the light, and finally, the reception of the light. So let's move into our first section. That's the power of the light in verses 4 and 5. But before we get into verses 4 and 5, I want to quickly recap those three verses that we covered last week in our opening study of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, if you'll look there to verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, I encouraged you last week to memorize those verses, and so we will have a quiz at the end of service. No, we're not going to do that. But I would encourage you to take those words to heart, to memorize those words, to meditate upon them, because what we found is just so much. And if you miss that study, you can listen to it or watch it online. But as we looked at verses 1 and 2, we saw that the word eternally pre-existed. That when the universe came into being, when the universe was created, the word was already there. He already existed. We also saw that the word was with God. Speaking of a face-to-face relationship, denoting the equality of the word and God the Father. And then we saw in the last part of verse 1 that the word was God. Speaking of the essence of God, that the word is full deity. He's fully God, just as much as God as God the Father is. Then verses, you know, three, two kind of recapped a little bit about verse one, the the face-to-face relationship. And then verse three, we saw that the word was the agent of creation, that everything that was made was made through him. So it's this in in our, and it's our context. It's with this as our background or foundation that leads us into verse four. Notice in him was life. In him was life. Please notice that we're not told that the word created life, but that in him was life. The idea being that life already existed in him. That, that, that the life that we have is actually a life that he gives. And that ties into what we've seen in Colossians, that by him all things consist. And so this wonderful idea, this wonderful biblical truth, that life is not merely something that Jesus created, that the word created, but it's something that flows out of him. That life comes from him, that all life is dependent upon him. 
And while the Apostle John's primary focus here in verse 4 is spiritual life, because that's the, the point of this gospel, remember, John had told us that the whole point he wrote this gospel was so that people might see what Jesus did, see who he was, and that they might believe. And that by believing, they have eternal life. So while the primary focus is spiritual life here, it's also true that all physical life came from his, him as well. So all life, whether spiritual life or physical life, finds its origin in, in the Word in the Son of God, in Christ. He is the wellspring of all life, whether physical or spiritual. You see, our very existence, both spiritually and physically, is dependent upon the Word. And that changes things because we often say things like, well, this is my life. But in reality, it's not true. It's His life. We are merely stewards of the life that he has given. It really belongs to him. And the Apostle John's going to remind us throughout this gospel that when we're born, we receive physical life from him. But when we're born again, we receive spiritual life. And that's important. That everyone who is born into this world, they, they're born into this world with physical life, but without spiritual life. They're, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. It's not until a person is born again that they receive that spiritual life. And I love what the Lord Jesus had to say about life in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So it's something for us to meditate on, something for us to think about is the fact that Jesus came to give people the abundant life. And as you and I don't experience perhaps abundant spiritual life, the most likely cause is we're disconnected in some way from Christ. Relationally disconnected, we're chasing after something that we think will give us life, but the abundant life is found in him and only in him. Now, continuing on in John 1, 4, we read, in him was life and the life was the light of men. So here we come back to this idea of light. Now, light in this context used right here, it speaks of understanding, of moral insight, of spiritual vision. That the light of Jesus, when the Lord Jesus comes into a life, when the person's born again, he penetrates and enlightens hearts and minds. You've experienced this if you're a born again believer. You thought a certain way about life. You saw life a certain way. And then when you were born again, you began to realize how I was looking at life was wrong. I didn't see things clearly. I was walking in darkness and not in light. And the wonderful thing about this in verse 4, it's, it's, it's very inclusive. That anyone and everyone who comes into contact with Christ can be enlightened if they submit to the light he offers. The reason why the world walks in, in darkness is because they refuse to come to the light. But anyone who wants to come to the light, anyone who's willing to come to Christ, can receive the light that he gives, and that light gives life. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, he entered this dark and fallen world to give spiritual light. He came on the scene so that he might save men and women, might offer them eternal life, and give light to a darkened world. Isaiah had prophesied of this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, where Isaiah wrote, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So it's a wonderful prophecy of the incarnation that when the Lord Jesus took on humanity, then what was going to happen is he was going to share the light of spiritual life with those he came into contact with. Now, I also want you to notice here in John chapter 1, verse 5, that this word shines, it's actually in the present tense. So it's not just something that happened in the past. It's not something that took place merely during the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry, but it's actually something that continues on to this very day. That even right now, as the gospel is being proclaimed to you, as the word is being taught, then that light of Jesus Christ is shining. And, and so with this, I believe that the Apostle John is reminding his readers, reminding us, that the light of the Lord Jesus did not only shine during his incarnation, but it's still shining today. Now, as we think about that, as we look at the world around us, full of darkness and discouragement and deception, we say, well, what's going on? If, G, if this light is still shining, well, what's happening? Well, the fact of the matter, the, the tragic truth, is that the majority of people simply refuse to come to the light. The light is available, but people don't like the light. In John chapter 3, which we'll get there to eventually, John chapter 3 in verses 19 and 20, Jesus said this, This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. I didn't become a believer until I was in my early 20s, and something that had never really kind of, I had never really grasped, made sense to me after I started to understand the scriptures. I, I began to look at buildings as I drove by, and I noticed that there were these certain buildings, these establishments that didn't have any windows. It was very purposeful because the things that were happening in these certain establishments, they didn't want the light in. Because what was happening in those places was darkness, was sin, was wickedness. And so you think about these different establishments that don't have windows. Why? It's by design. Because men who love darkness want to participate in the darkness, don't want the light shining in, don't want their deeds exposed. That's why people don't come to Christ. People don't come to Christ because they don't want him shining his light on their darkness. Don't want to admit their sin, the change that needs to happen. Blaise Pascal put it this way, quote, There is enough light for those who only desire to see the light, and enough darkness for those who only desire the darkness. So wonderful. The Lord Jesus gives us choice. There's plenty of light for those who wish to come to him. But if a person says, I don't want the light, well, then there's plenty of darkness for them to hide in. Now, continuing on in John 1, 5, we read, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That's the word comprehend here. It's, a, it's an interesting word in the Greek. It can mean a few different things. So I want to talk about that for just a minute, because it can mean take hold of. It can mean take hold of. It can mean overpower, or it can mean understand. So when we translate it as comprehend, or I'm sorry, the, the New King James translators, they translate it as comprehend, they're taking it to be understand. But I don't know that that's the fullness of the meaning, because I think this verse it may mean that darkness did not take hold of or understand the light, or that darkness did not overcome the light. And in reality, I believe that all of this is true. The fact of the matter is, fallen human beings, when Jesus came on the scene, for the most part, they didn't appropriate the light. They didn't receive the light. They didn't understand the light, nor did they overtake or overpower the light. You see, although Satan and his forces continually resist the light, they cannot overthrow its power. And so that's the, the primary meaning that, that most commentators believe, is that the, the darkness did not overtake it, did not overthrow it, did not overpower it. And that's what I want to think about for just a minute to share with you, is the fact of the matter, the scriptures make it clear, as we sang earlier, that Jesus is going to win in the end. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear how it's going to turn out. The end has already been written. You can read it in the book of Revelation. And by the way, Jesus wins. And so the fact of the matter is light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it, did not overpower it. Satan and his forces, again, they continually resist the light, but they can't overthrow its power. Darkness is not able to overcome or conquer the light. Now, if we get up every morning, and we spend an hour scrolling the internet, looking at the news and looking at the complaints and looking at the dark darkness and looking at the deception and looking at those things, we're going to be discouraged. And we're going to doubt these things. We're going to doubt that the light is going to win. We have to understand the world is dark, as just as the scripture said it was. But the scriptures make it clear that the Lord is going to win in the end. And we've experienced this on a daily basis. We've experienced it in a totally darkened room, but then once we turn on the light, what happens? The darkness flees. It's funny, you know, I, I'm by nature a very fearful person. It's something that I want to work on. But one of the biggest fears I had in, in my life was the room that I was in, that I stayed in, was my room I grew up in. It had this old ceiling fan. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these, but it had this kind of weird-looking frosted glass where there was a single light bulb in there. Well, I was too small to change that on my own, and if that light went off during the day, I knew that when night fell, I was going to be afraid. I would try to convince my dad to change that bulb before the sun went down, <laughs> but oftentimes he would be too busy, and I would literally be afraid to come down to my room because who knows what is waiting for me under my bed or in my closet. But I knew once that bulb was replaced and I turned that light on, there was no longer a reason to be afraid because everything was illuminated. We've experienced this. Just as a single candle can overcome a room filled with darkness, so also the powers of darkness are overcome by the Lord Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. Please realize that darkness is no thing. Darkness is merely the absence of light. And then when the light of Christ comes on the scene, when he desires to reveal himself in his fullness, when it's his time to return and establish himself upon this earth, darkness has no choice but to flee in his face. 
So the application question for us as we close this first section is simply this. Do you truly believe that the light is powerful enough to extinguish the darkness? Or are you fearing that the darkness will overcome the light? As you look around and as you worry about political candidates and you worry about social issues and you worry about you know, things that are happening, whether it's disease or whether it's with the environment and all of that, do you set that aside and say, here's the deal. The scriptures teach me that the light is going to overcome the darkness. Do you trust that? Because if you trust that, then you're lining up with truth. But if you don't trust that, then what's happening is you're siding with fear and you're siding with falseness. Inevitably, it's going to bring great anxiety to your life. Let's move now from the power of the light to our second section. And that's the witness of the light in verses 6 through 9. We read in verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this John here is of John the Baptist. He's not John the Apostle John. The Apostle John never refers to himself by name in this gospel. Instead, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I just love that. And I think that we should all have business cards, you know, that say our name and, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, because it's true of all of us. John just was willing to put it out there. Now, verse 6, this word sent here, it means set apart and sent out on a certain mission. It speaks of a person who was chosen and given a certain mission to carry out. Now, the word sent is vital to understand this man, John, who again is John the Baptist, because now we begin to understand his ministry, that John the Baptist was sent by God. So think about that for just a minute. John the Baptist was sent by God. So John had great authority. In fact, he could be commissioned by no one greater, by no greater authority. You know, sometimes an older sibling will say to a younger sibling, hey, do this, go do that thing. But then the parent comes in and say, no, don't listen to that older, older sibling's authority. You do what I said to do. And so we know that when, when there's a greater authority, that greater authority is the one to be listened to. Well, there's no greater authority than God. And so the fact that John was sent by God says that he's sent by the greatest authority as, that there is. And there's an application question for you and I as we think about John, is that who has commissioned the life that we are living? Who has sent us? The life that we are living right now, the job that we're working, the direction that we're going, who has commissioned us? Because if we've commissioned ourselves, we're in trouble. If we have merely sent ourselves, then at the end of the day, we're living lives of futility, lives that will end in despair. Because even believers can do this. Believers can be born again, but somewhere along the way say, you know what, I'm going to kind of just do my own thing. I'm going to go in my own direction. I'm going to commission myself. And the problem with that is is that we're going to have to answer to the Lord for that. And we're going to be spinning our wheels because we're going in a direction he hasn't called us to go. When I was back a youth pastor at Calvary Houston, and you know, as I got sent out and different people got sent out into the mission field to go plant churches, there was a saying I heard that goes like this, there are those who were sent and those who just went. There were those who were sent and those who just went. In other words, there were certain people that, you know, the, the pastor saw calling on their life and said, yes, you're commissioned, go out and start a fellowship. And there are other people who said, you know, I'm just going to go do this thing. And I've, I've never seen the success of those who just went. <laughs> it usually ended up going poorly. And so it is for our lives. We don't want to be those who just went. We want to be those who are sent, those who are commissioned by God. Well, thankfully, the Lord gives an open invitation that anyone who wants to be commissioned by him, anyone who wants to be sent by him is invited to do so. But the, the, the catch, if you will, is this. We have to obey. It's not the Lord, hey, Lord, bless this mess. Just get on board with what I'm already doing. Instead, Lord, what is it you want me to do? And I'll go. It's like Isaiah chapter 6 when the Lord said, hey, you know, who shall I send? And then Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. That was the attitude of John the Baptist. Now, moving on to verse 7, we read more about John. Notice, this man came for a witness. Here we see that John the Baptist was sent as the witness of the light. And you know what a witness is. Witness is one who testifies or declares. Most often we're familiar with this in the sense of a court of law. We've, we've seen just different you know, police shows or you know, law and order and stuff, and they call witnesses to the stand to testify for what they've seen. And that's who John was. He was testifying to, to the light. Now, in this gospel, the apostle John is going to use this word witness 33 times as a verb 
And 14 times it's a noun. Tells it's a very important word that John is going to use. And this term witness is so important to the Apostle John's ultimate purpose. The Apostle John is basically through this gospel stacking up witnesses so that people would believe that Jesus is the Messiah that we would believe in him. And so these witness after witness after witness, John is going to use so that people might believe. And the application for us as believers is that we're to be witnesses as well. That's what we're called to be as we carry out the great commission, witnesses to Christ. And here's what Christ has done in my life. And here's what his word says. And this is how he's changed me. And this is the kind of struggles I've had. We continually witness for the light. Continuing on in verse seven, notice this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now, as we consider this verse, it's interesting to note, and this is a different angle. I never thought about John the Baptist in this way, that John the Baptist was actually the human link between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. As you think about the Old Covenant and then the New Covenant, John the Baptist was the link because here was what John the Baptist was. He was the last Old Testament prophet, and he was the first Christian witness. It's just a cool thing to think about. And Jesus would say of John the Baptist, he said, of those born of women, there's not arisen a greater than John the Baptist up until that time. Because he's a forerunner of the Messiah. So the last Old Testament prophet and the first Christian witness. And what was his ministry? Well, you can read about it in all four of the Gospels. He was calling people to repentance. He was calling people to repentance to have a change of mind that led to a change of behavior. And then he was pointing them to the Messiah. John the Baptist if you will. He was the opening act. If you go to a concert, you know, and you really want to see the headliner, but you kind of have to sit through <laughs> the opening acts until you get to the headliner. Well, I don't think you just had to sit through John the Baptist. I don't want to diminish his amazing ministry, but he was, at the end of the day, the opening act. And Jesus was the main attraction. Now, please notice this very important word at the end of verse 7, a word that we will see so much as we travel through the gospel of John together. It's the word believe. That word believe there, it means to trust, to have confidence in, to be fully persuaded about. There's something that each and every one of you have shown belief in this morning at this time, and it's the chairs that you're sitting in. As you sat in those chairs, whether you realized it or not, you were trusting, you were having confidence, you were fully persuaded in that chair's ability to hold you up. And so this word believe that, Paul, that John uses so often, in fact, he uses it nearly a hundred times in this gospel, highlighting the unsurpassed importance of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing more important, please hear me, there is nothing more important in this life than believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing more important. Because without Christ, all is lost. And so with that said, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have already done the most important thing that you can ever do in this life. Now, some of you make decisions easily, and it's not a struggle for you. You just kind of go with it. For someone like me, as I just kind of see all the facets of something, and I really struggle with making decisions. I struggle with making the right decisions. You know, sometimes I'm there in front of Whataburger, and I'm just taking me forever, you know, to kind of make just the right decision. But seriously, think about that. Every other decision that you have made or will make in your life is of secondary importance to believing in the Lord Jesus. No matter how stressful decision-making may or may not be to you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've already made the most important decision. You've already taken care of that most important decision. And if you believe that, if you recognize that, if you realize it, then you take that to heart, then what will happen is you'll have great peace. They say, okay, I'm going to choose this thing, I'm going to choose that thing. But that's secondary I've already placed my faith. I believed in Jesus Christ. So the greatest thing is taken care of. Everything else after that is lesser. Let's move on to verse 8. Notice, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. In other words, John the Baptist was not the light that the Apostle John is talking about. Instead, John the Baptist was a witness of the light. And I love that. Because you think about this kind of from a, a physical standpoint, from an astronomical standpoint, the moon is merely a witness of the sun. Have you ever thought about that? That the moon doesn't have its own light. It does, it's not a, a source of light. It's merely a witness. The moon is not the light, but it reflects the light of the sun. So the next time you go out at night and you see the moon, think about the fact that that moon is a witness of the sun. And because you see the light of the moon, you know the sun is still shining. 
It's witnessing to the fact that even though you don't see the sun right now, the sun is still shining. And so the application for us as we think about this is that as believers, we are called to reflect the light of Christ. We are to point others to Christ. We are not to draw people after ourselves. It is hard oftentimes in this dark world to see Christ. It's easy for people to say, well, I don't see the sun is shining because it's dark. Well, let us be the moons in this world. Let us be people that they don't see Christ directly. They can actually see his light as it's reflected off of us. That we, like John the Baptist, are not the light, but witnesses to that light. And let our attitude also be that of John the Baptist. Just as the moon makes way as the sun comes on the scene, so John the Baptist said this in John 3, verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. If that's our attitude as witnesses, then I want to be a witness not so that I can have a greater sphere of influence or so that I can be bigger so more people can praise me, but actually so that people can see Christ more and more, then we'll be on the right track. Because the more that we make our lives about Christ and the less that we make them about ourselves, the better off we're going to be. Because that's who we were created to be. Like John the Baptist, we're created to be witnesses of the light. Now, continuing on in John 1 to verse 9, notice, that was the true light. This is an interesting word, the true light. So we're talking about the word again, talking about the Son of God. He was the true light. Now that word true, we often think about it in context to false. Something is true or something's false. You know, we, we loved those when we were taking tests in school. Maybe if you're still in school, true and false, you're like, I got a 50% chance. 50-50. <laughs> We think true or false. But the word true here is not in the context of true or false. It's kind of true in the sense of source or fulfillment. In other words, Jesus is the true light because he's the fulfillment of the partial light of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was shadows. It was a kind of a partial light, a hazy light. But then once Jesus comes on the scene, he's the fulfillment. He's the full light. It's kind of like this. Maybe you've gone hiking through a dense forest. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of dark in there, and you just see little beams of light coming through. So you know that the light is there, but it's obscured, it's scattered beams. But then you walk out into a clearing, and you see the sun directly. The old covenant was kind of like walking through that forest. You're seeing little beams of light, but when Jesus Christ came on the scene in the incarnation, it's like walking into that clearing and seeing the light fully. Now, continuing on in verse 9, notice, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now, I spent a lot of time looking at this verse because most commentators believe that this is not a great phrasing of this verse. In fact, most commentators believe that this verse would be better translated along these lines. That was the true light which, coming into the world, gives light to every man. So the idea is that when Jesus Christ came into the world, then he shared light. That the, when the word took on human nature, in addition to his deity, that he did it so that he might reveal the truth to mankind. And this ties into what we read in John 8, 12, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so this wonderful truth that we see here in this verse, in verse 9, is this idea that the Lord Jesus is willing to illuminate anyone who would come to him. Anyone. From any tribe or tongue or people or nation. Any socioeconomic bracket, any intellectual level, any of those things. Anyone who comes to Jesus, he will reveal the light to him. Anyone who wants the light, anyone who wants the truth can find it in him. And so therefore, as believers, we're to continue to be those witnesses of the light. This brings us to our third section, and that's the rejection of the light in verses 10 and 11. Please notice verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now, as we covered last week, the New Testament makes it clear that the Lord Jesus was the agent of creation, that everything was made through him. And I want to remind you of three verses that testify of that, or actually five verses. First one is John chapter 1, verse 3. We've read it, but I want to remind you of it again, that all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Everything was made through Jesus Christ. And the reason why I'm going to kind of bring this out over and over again is to remind ourselves of the deity of Christ, that he's the creator, 
Then we read also last week Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Paul makes it clear that everything that there is, whether it's a a visible thing, it's an invisible. Whether it's a physical, whether it's a spiritual, Jesus made it all. It was all made through him, and then Paul says it was made for him, that that it belongs to him, that it was made for his good pleasure. He's before all things. He pre-existed before the creation, and in him all things consist. So everything is held together by him. Made all things, made all things for himself, and, and he still holds everything together. And then this is also spoken of in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, where we read, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world's. So everything was made through Jesus and everything's going to be inherited by Jesus. Well, so sadly, though, as we look once again at verse 10, notice he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Even though the Lord Jesus was the creator of the world, the world didn't know him. The world didn't recognize him for who he was. And this still holds true today. When I was growing up, and I didn't know who the Lord was, I had some, as I talked about last week, some passing acquaintances with representations of Christ, but I thought my life was about me. My life was what I want and kind of how I can get those things and achieve my goals. And, you know, and I I saw all those kitty posters that said I could do whatever I wanted to do and just hang in there and all those things. But the reality of the matter is the scriptural truth is that this world is about Jesus. It was made through him and for him and by him and in him all things consist. And so the problem with this world is a sin problem. It's a problem where people won't recognize the creator. The majority of the world fails to recognize the Lord Jesus as their creator. They think that they're their own gods, and we can fall into this even as believers, doing our own things. And so it's not until people comes to, come to grips with this truth that they did not make themselves, that Jesus made them for himself. He's the one holding them together. Then once they come to grips with that truth and come in line and serve him, then what happens is they can live lives effectively. And so for us, as we're seeking to share the gospel, we must not neglect this truth that Jesus is the creator, that all owe allegiance to him, that all life comes from him. So we share that truth with others because if we kind of, in a sense, peddle the gospel as just something that can help good people get better, we're missing the point. The point is is that human beings have rebelled against their creator. They have caused, they have submitted or, you know, taken part in cosmic treason. And so the creator graciously came to earth as a man to rescue his wayward creation to offer forgiveness, to bring them back into relationship with himself. And it all starts with recognizing Jesus as creator. As we recognize him as creator, then all these other things fall into place. Moving on to verse 11, notice, he came to his own. Now, it's interesting here because as John and what he, how he uses the Greek, we have to really kind of dig in. This he came to his own, in the Greek it really speaks of he came to his own things. In other words, he came to that which belonged to him. And so the, the Greek expression can actually even be used to describe a homecoming. You know, when we think of a homecoming, we often think about, you know, like a football game. Or remember back in those days when there was such a thing as football? Uh, you know, they think about that. And, and so the homecoming, or, you know, perhaps in a, in a greater standpoint, we think about, you know, in like you know, World War I and the soldiers coming back from overseas on that ship. And, and there's that homecoming. There's a band and people excited for those soldiers to return home. That's kind of what we have here, this homecoming. The big idea that is when he came to his own, he came to his own things, is that when the Lord Jesus came, to earth, he was not trespassing. He was not coming on someone else's property. You've probably been out hiking before, and you'll see there's you know certain areas where there'll be a barbed wire fence, and it says, you know, mark no trespassing. If you go over that fence, no telling what might happen to you. Well, these no trespassing signs don't apply to the Lord Jesus because it's his, because he made it. 
And so when Jesus came, he came to reside on a planet which he himself had made. Unfortunately, we see the rejection of the light as we continue on in verse 11. No, he, notice he came to his own, or he came to his own things, and his own did not receive him. Now, this second his own doesn't refer to his own things, but it actually refers to his own people. So he came to his own things, and his own people did not receive him. Of course, speaking of the Jewish people. Because by and large, the Jewish people did not receive him as their Messiah. So the idea, again, is that the light, the Lord Jesus, he came to his own world, to his own people, and his own people rejected him. Tragically, when he came into the world, the Lord Jesus prevented, sorry, presented himself to the Jews as their Messiah, but they didn't receive him. And that word receive here is very interesting. Here in verse 11, it means to receive with favor. It means to welcome. So instead of a welcome mat, the Lord Jesus actually had a door slammed in his face. And that although the Israelites possessed the scriptures that testified of his person and coming, most still did not accept him. And why is that? Well, most of the Israelite people rejected Jesus because they wanted simply a conquering king, but not a suffering savior. They, they wanted someone to overthrow Rome. They wanted someone to fix their life now. They wanted to have their best life now. They wanted to find the champion in themselves. But instead, the Lord Jesus said, your greatest need is your sin. You've got to take care of your sin. So he came in his first coming, his incarnation as a suffering savior, in his second coming, in his return, Revelation 19, he will return as a conquering king. But the fact of the matter is most rejected him because they wanted simply that conquering king, and sadly, most reject him now. And if we ended here with this verse, verse 11, that would be a sad place to stop. But thankfully, as we move into our final section, verses 12 and 13, we see that not all rejected the light. In fact, we see the reception of the light, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So there's so much here. I want to break this verse into three pieces. I want to look at the first part, the middle part, and the last part. So let's look at the first part. Notice, but as many as received him. So in contrast to those in the last two verses who rejected the Lord Jesus, there were those who received him. And I want you to remind yourself of that. That yes, as you try to share and as you witness, as you look around at this world, yes, the majority of mankind reject him, absolutely, but there's still many who receive him. Please remember that. Please focus on that. Please focus it, that people are being saved every day, that the Lord Jesus is still adding to the church daily, such as those who are being saved. Now, this word received here, again, it has this idea of accepting or welcoming. To receive Jesus is to welcome and acknowledge him as both Savior and Lord. Now, it's important to understand that this receiving, it's not merely an intellectual agreement with some facts. This, this receiving is not, I check these boxes, I believe these things about Jesus. It's more than that. It's a welcoming of him and a submitting to him in personal relationship. Perhaps you had that, you know, awkward experience of going over to someone's house, maybe for a party or for whatever it is, and they invite you in, but they don't really want you there. <laughs> They're ready for you to leave as soon as you will. That's not to be our relationship with the Lord. Instead, receiving the Lord Jesus is like when you welcome someone to your home and you treat them like they're a member of your family. You're glad that they're there. You give them the best place on the couch. You offer them a drink, that kind of thing. This is what receiving Jesus means. It's a wholehearted welcoming into your life. But beware, when you receive the Lord Jesus in your life, once he comes in, he's not willing to merely stay as a guest. He takes over as head of the household. And before long, he's going to be you know, knocking out walls and redoing your kitchen and all kinds of stuff. He is going to be revamp your inner life to make it acceptable to him, to make it the best that it can be. That's receiving him. Let's look at the middle part of verse 12. Notice, to them, to those who received him, notice, he gave the right to become children of God. That word right is amazing. It speaks of authority or permission. Oftentimes in this world, if a person has the right badge and you know, a key card, they, can, they have the right to enter into certain spaces. And this is the ultimate key card here, that anyone who receives the Lord Jesus, they have the right, the authority, the permission to become a child of God. In context, it speaks of God granting the right to be born again. That's what it speaks about. That when a person receives Jesus Christ, welcomes Jesus as who he is into their life, then what God says is you have the right to be born again. Now, we know that happens in, a, you know, in an instant of time. 
You're born again by the Spirit. But it's only because God gave you the right to do that. You're born again into the family of God. The idea is that no one can attain this new birth by his or her power or merit or ability or political connections or stock options or any of those things. Only God can grant this new birth. Now, please notice that word become there, the right to become children of God. It's a verb that implies a change of nature. And so this phrase, the right to become children of God, indicates clearly that people are not spiritual children of God by natural birth. For we cannot become what we already are. Think about that for just a minute. If you become a child of God when you receive Jesus Christ, that means you don't come into this world as a child of God. You come into this world at enmity with God. You come into this world as a child of darkness. And so the, the important thing we have to remember is that all people by nature are creations of God. All people by nature are creations of God. They're made in the image of God. But only those who are born again are children of God. Sometimes well-meaning Christians say, well, we're just all children of God. That is not a biblical idea. The biblical idea is that we're all creations of God, we're all made in God's image, but it's not until a person is born again, not until a person receives Jesus Christ, that they are given the right to become children of God. So for us as believers, we have to tell people the truth. If a person is not born again, they are not a child of God. They're on their way to destruction. The good news is, though, if they would receive Jesus Christ, they will be given the right to become a child of God. Now to the last part of verse 12, notice, to those who believe in his name. This word believe in, again, it means a personal trust, that full confidence we're lying in. And then the name of Jesus doesn't merely just mean his name as kind of the letters of his name. It refers to what is true about him, the totality of his person, his character, who he is. And so as we put these pieces together, this receiving and believing in his name are are really two sides of the same coin. You can't truly receive the Lord Jesus without believing in the the Lord Jesus. You can't really believe in his name without receiving him. Those two things go together. But the person who receives him, welcomes him, who believes everything about him, that person is given the right to become a child of God. Let's move now to the final verse of our study, verse 13. Notice, these individuals of verse 2 who received and believed and became children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, this verse is, of course, describing those who have believed and received in the Lord Jesus and become children of God. And what John is pointing out here is that salvation is fully of God. That the the only thing that we do is receive it, is believe it. But we we can't make it happen. We can't cause ourselves to be born again. It's a gift of God through through us believing and receiving. You see here, this new spiritual birth, it's not of blood. In other words, it's not physical generation or by parents. One of the biggest difficulties that the Lord Jesus encountered with Israel is the Israelites believed that they were going to heaven because they were descendants of Abraham. He said, we've got the blood. You know, it's blood. And so so they kind of imagined in their own mind that, that God was this ultimate racist, right? That because you're of a certain blood, you're automatically in. It was a falsehood. Nowhere in the scriptures is that ever taught. Way back with Abraham, it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's always been by faith, not by blood. And so you can't be born again because you're from the right bloodline. No, it has to be through receiving and believing, believing and receiving. And then also we're told here in verse 13, it's not by the will of the flesh. In other words, it's not through personal effort. It's not through, well, I I got myself baptized and I was circumcised or I did this or I took communion or I read the Bible and I prayed and I did all that. No, no, no. It's not through effort that a person's born again. And then neither is it new birth, we're told, by the will of man. In other words, it's not something that another individual can do for us. It's not that somebody else can kind of make it happen for us. Each person must individually trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life. It's a gift to be received and not a reward achieved through any human effort. And I love how William McDonald explained this verse, and I'll read this as we begin to wind down our time. He explained this verse here in verse 13 as three ways by which we are not born again. Not of blood. This means that a person does not become a Christian through having Christian parents. Salvation is not passed down from parent to child through the bloodstream. It is not of the will of the flesh. 
In other words, a person does not have the power in his own flesh to produce the new birth. Although he must be willing in order to be saved, yet his own will is not enough to save him, nor of the will of man. No other man can save a person. A preacher, for instance, may be very anxious to see a certain person born again, but he does not have power to produce this marvelous birth. How then does this birth take place? The answer is found in the words, but of God. This means simply that the power to produce the new birth does not rest with anything or anyone but God. Now, with that said, we'll stop here for today and Lord willing, pick up in verse 14 next week. But before we close, I want to leave you with three application questions taken from our study. Number one is, do you believe that the light will ultimately overpower the darkness? Do you believe that? And if you don't, Please realize that those false thoughts that you have are leading to most likely bad feelings and bad behaviors. And so we need to change our thoughts. Our thoughts need to be true. The truth of the scripture is this, that the light will overpower the darkness. Get into the word. Remind yourself of this truth. No matter what you read on the internet, no matter how dark things look, realize in the end the light will overpower the darkness. Number two. Like John the Baptist, are you willing to be sent by God as a witness of the light? Or are you willing to lay down your own commissioning, your own agenda, your own witness, and instead say, I want to be sent by the Lord. And whatever it is, wherever he has me, whether it's school or at work or at home, wherever, I want to be commissioned by him. I want to be sent as a witness of the light. And thirdly and finally, if you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're not yet a Christian, are you willing to believe and receive? Believe in his name, receive him, welcome into your life. You can pray to him, ask him into your life, and realize that once you do, once you believe and receive, you will be given the right to become a child of God and be born again by the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this time and for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing to use us, the flawed vessels that we are, and we thank you, Lord, that as dark as it seems, we know that the light is still shining. Lord, and we know that the day is coming when you're going to return. But we pray, Lord, that we would not only pray for your turn, but we would occupy until you come. Lord, that we would be faithful on this earth for as long as you leave us. That you would empower us, fill us afresh with your spirit to do those things you've called us to do in a way that honors you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Covers me 
Father's feet.